Spider-Man 2 really makes you feel like Spider-Man. No, but really, it does. There is something to be said that whenever a developer announces a new game and everyone just universally agrees that it's gonna be great, are we taking this for granted? In a world where there are so many AAA disappointments and greedy business practices, when we get a good game and just casually brush it off as, oh yeah, it's good, what else you got? Are we really appreciating the consistency? That is what I think every time I play a Spider-Man game made by Insomniac. And once again with Spider-Man 2, they have captured the essence of what a Spider-Man game should be. For the most part. Now, whatever side you're on in the console war, because every time there's a Sony or Xbox exclusive, there's bound to be console war commentary and review bombing fanatics because I hate Sony or Xbox One is shit, son! We should all come forward and acknowledge when we have a good game on our hands, which is what Spider-Man 2 is. Across platform, you will not find combat, traversal, and storytelling that feels as fluid as Spider-Man all while giving you the giant movie feel of cinematic action pieces. And when looking at Spider-Man 2, it has all of that and then some. It still feels great to swing around the city, fight crime, do side activities, stop traffic on the Queensboro Bridge. Come on, man, I need to get to my Genshin dailies! However, while playing this game, there was something I just could not let go of. Something that festered in the back of my mind for the majority of my playthrough. And by the end, it became clear. Spider-Man 2 is a very good game and a great sequel. That's a step back in almost every category from the first game. What the fuck did you just say, Sal? Now, believe me, I am not saying this game is bad. Far from it. It just shows how great that first game was. And it also shows why, when some people refer to it as the greatest superhero game of all time, you really should be comparing it with its peers before you make that distinction, especially if it's a sequel. Now, if you make the comparison and still believe that, then alright. But I think some people are just making blind declarations on this game without even thinking about what made other superhero games great, like the first one. So, why exactly did I feel this way? Let's find out, shall we? So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. So just to let you know, this video is gonna be spoiler heavy, because the points I make relate to things that can be considered spoilery, and there wouldn't be a point to put timestamps every five minutes, so here's your warning. Ready? Okay, break. Spider-Man 2 takes place two years after the events of the first game and 10 months after Miles Morales. This time, you get to play as both Peter and Miles, and the game lets you swap back and forth between the two throughout your playthrough, with some main missions and side activities being locked to a specific Spider-Man. By this time, the both of them have become a very cohesive team, and they've been able to keep the city safe from supervillains and flame Antifa, but soon they are both met with the invasion of their newest threat, Kraven the Hunter who turns the city into his own superhero and supervillain hunting ground. All the while, you have the gang's reunion with Harry Osborn, who's harboring something much darker than anyone could have imagined. So let's start off by explaining what Spider-Man 2 does better than its predecessor. Number one, the graphics. Holy crap. New York City has never looked better. Seriously, it looks better in this game than it does in real life. New York City just feels alive. Between the beeping car horns, the NPC pathways that never seem out of place, everything is also fully rendered. Not once did it feel like the game had to load anything in, it actually was loaded in. I'm also not one to harp on ray tracing, but when you're swinging through New York and you see the reflections of sunlight on the windows of buildings, the immersion is just taken to the next level. It might not sound like a lot when I'm saying it, but trust me, it does way more than you think. They even took the time to animate people in the buildings themselves, even if what they're doing doesn't make sense. Um, buddy, there's nothing on the TV. What are you watching, my guy? I really hope I don't catch anyone doing any funny business. Also, there's just a random, um, office that's, uh, wait a minute, it's the same angle. What sort of pen and Teller shit is this? The game also ran pretty well, although I encountered a decent number of glitches throughout. On the more lighthearted side, we got clip it. <laughs> uh, it looks like we've discovered platform nine and three quarters. We also got a nice fight here with symbiotes when- <laughs> Where are you going, buddy? <laughs> God has accepted him into his kingdom. This man is just convulsing. I, I think we might need to call an ambulance. Oh my God, he's still going. On a more serious note, I had about two crashes with the game and there were three separate occasions where I would get to an objective and it just wouldn't progress. 
I quit and came back in and it was fine, but it was still annoying and unnecessary. While nobody really uses fast travel in a Spider-Man game, usually because you can just swing around everywhere, this is the most seamless fast travel I've ever seen, ever. You just pick your district and boom, you zoom in, no time at all. Too bad nobody uses it. Insomniac has been the best at fully taking advantage of the abilities of the PS5, and Spider-Man 2 is definitely the pinnacle of the PS5 experience in this way. Sticking with the open world, they kept Manhattan largely the same, but they also added Queens and Brooklyn into the game. They needed some things to make New York feel different from the first game, and they do their job. They're also where Peter and Miles live, so it makes sense why they would have their neighborhoods actually accessible. The world still doesn't feel too big, because after all, you're swinging through the city at ridiculous speeds, so you barely notice. It also still makes the world feel fresh, even though it's largely the same as the last two games. Sometimes you forget the layout is even identical. Other times... How many times are we going to end up at the same cargo port? Which brings me to the first new mechanic that Insomniac brings to the table. The web wings. Now, I've seen mixed reaction to this all over the internet, but in my opinion, I think it's a great addition to traversal, if you use it in moderation. Along with the point launch, it's a great way to vary up the pace that you're traveling at. And in this role, it is more than welcome. Just don't rely on it as your only means of travel, because that's when it gets old. Remember, you're playing a Spider-Man game, so web swinging is where it's at. The best way to do it is swing, swing, swing. Okay, time to change it up. Okay, time's up. That's how you will get the most out of it, because you still want that sick web landing. Perfect. Everything. You also have these giant slingshot platforms that launch you crazy distances and speeds, but I only used it once, maybe twice. I just personally found swinging much more fun without having to completely halt the game, but maybe that's just me. The MJ stealth missions are back. Shit. But this time she's equipped with a taser, so you're not actually helpless if you get caught. Though it's kind of sad when a girl with a few months of training is just taking out trained killers without anyone knowing, and that this wasn't a headshot. Don't worry, we'll get to that later. So now we're done with all that, it's time to talk about the combat. Overall, the combat for Spider-Man 2 was still, um, amazing. Launching yourself towards enemies and bouncing around like a pinball machine is still as fluid and as effortless as the first game was. Same goes for airborne combos. Welcome to your United flight, fly the friendly neighborhood skies. Don't worry, I have experience dealing with rowdy passengers. <laughs> the game also introduces the parry, which is highly encouraged throughout the game, as there's a lot of hunter enemies with swords and axes that have attacks you have to parry, as well as boss fights, because you can't break through their defenses without using the parry. Luckily, it's very generous to use, and the tell for this is much different than the regular spider sense, but sometimes it can still be hard to distinguish it right away because this game has a lot of enemies. Like waves and waves and waves of enemies. And there's a lot of chaos happening. So yeah, good luck reading it on the fly. Maybe it's a skill issue. Maybe I do need to get good. But there's a difference between being able to conquer a hard enemy and trying to figure out what the hell is happening on my screen. It's not bad, but I just wished it was a little bit better. When you're in one-on-one -on -one fights, it's easier, obviously. The game also introduces abilities, and... Uh, this is where we get our first downgrade. Allow me to explain. The abilities are not bad. In fact, I like them a lot. But these are here because... They cut down on the gadgets. Now, for as good as the combat is in Spider-Man, eventually it does get repetitive, which is where gadgets came in, and they felt great to use. They still have gadgets, and some are great, like the web grabber that pulls enemies into each other like something out of Looney Tunes. And when you upgrade it, it also pulls in objects that can dull out extra damage. That is satisfying as hell to use. Ricochet Web is also cool. A form of the Concussion Blast is back, and a dumbed-down Suspension Matrix, the upshot. But other than that, uh... Where the hell's the Impact Web? Where's the Web Bomb? You remember how fun these things were to use in the first game? We went from seven gadgets to four. I'm not counting the web shooters, you get that either way. The reason why I find this problematic is because the gadgets offer a variety of new ways to spice up combat, and giving us less to put in hotkey abilities just feels like the game has less of that same variety. Where the gadgets allow you to switch up from the punchy punchy, the abilities just feel like an extension of the punchy punchy. 
which kind of makes it feel less fun. Now, the developers explained in an IGN interview that they put less emphasis on gadgets because they didn't want to make it feel like you were a god, but instead of balancing the game out, you just made it so that it gets stale faster, at least in my eyes. And by the way, in the first game, you only had a limited amount of times you can use the gadgets, so you couldn't just abuse it. In this game, the gadgets recharge. And as far as not feeling like a god, honestly, screw it. You're a superhero. Give us everything. If you gave us every gadget from the first game, along with the new ones, and gave us the abilities, I would honestly not have a problem with it. And I don't think anyone else would either. You don't want us to run through everything? Then just make the enemies tougher. Now, the suspension matrix comes in the form of the launch ability, and Miles' electric powers nullify the use for the electric web, but bring back everything else, and let's ball! Let's talk upgrades and side content. This is where we start to get into really rocky territory. Since you're not playing as two Spider-Men, the game decides it needs to do more to save the environment, so their solution is, of course, to plant more skill trees. This time around, you have not one, not two, but three different skill trees between Peter and Miles. One for each of their specific abilities, and one for both of them that's their basic move upgrades. And the health, damage, and traversal skills are streamlined into the suit tech along with the gadget upgrades. Now, look, I'm not saying any of these upgrades are bad, and I'm not even saying they shouldn't be in here. I just didn't sign up to do calculus today. I feel like if we're gonna bash Ubisoft for having a lot of skill trees in their games, we gotta do the same for Spider-Man. Now, luckily, they made the UI much better, so only one skill tree is on the screen at a time. Thank God. That makes it much more manageable. But perhaps my biggest problem with it is not that the upgrades exist, but that there's so many that it actually took away something that I personally loved in the first game. That's the suit bonuses. In the original game, when you got a new suit, it came with certain stat bonuses, or perks that gave an extra incentive for wearing a new suit. Now in Spider-Man 2, with that gone, there's way more suits in the game, with four different color shades for each, but it's only cosmetic-based. So, what exactly is the incentive to change your outfit? You wanna switch up your look? Okay, that's fine, I found myself switching up too in the game. But in the first one, there was an actual reason to switch, besides cosmetic, and I feel like removing that kinda makes the suits expendable, aside from the symbiote and anti-venom suits. Now we get to something that I was not necessarily shocked by, but definitely disappointed by. The side content. Now, it's not bad. In fact, some of these are actually great. But like the overall game itself, it is a step back from the first game. A lot of these activities feel like they were just put in here just to have something for you to do. Where in the first game, it felt like it was actually fun to do, and therefore you wanted to pursue it more. The hideouts, or in this case, hunter blinds, are still great. The app requests are still good, especially the Howard and Grandpa missions that are... Oh my god, these capture the essence of Spider-Man, and these are definitely the highlights. Hey, Pidgey, do a barrel roll! Yeah! Oh boy, Howard. Ooh, this one hurt. You get missions like those that are great, but then you also get missions like the Alicia Pink quest. Like, we got a short run time here, I don't need to be playing as Alicia. Pete's side quest with the Cult of the Flame is also really good, where he teams back up with Yuri, who's now become the Wraith. Side note, I think it's great that Yuri is the actual name of Spider-Man's voice actor, and the woman who voices Yuri is actually his wife, Edelgard. I don't know, I just think that's kind of cute. I would also say the Mysteriums were slightly better than the Taskmaster time trials. I personally don't like the combat trials in Spider-Man games, but I think these were a little better because you still have the uncertainty of, is Mysterio really reformed? Other than that, everything kind of felt like filler. We got Prowler stashes, Marco's memories, EMF experiments, spider bots, photo ops, Brooklyn visions, unidentified targets, and symbiote nests, along with the recurring crimes. Prowler stashes are just puzzles that lead to more tech parts. Not bad, but it's just there. Marco's memories are kind of drab at first, just fighting Sandman clones, until you crack a piece of his fragmented memory, which is pretty cool to listen to his crazed thoughts at the thought of Craven hunting him. Wait a minute, do we take these rocks from the Nightmare Frontier? Like, holy crap. I mean, Bloodborne is a Sony exclusive. EMF experiments are hit and miss. Sometimes you get cool missions like shooting bee predators with a drone. Other times it's just like, why am I riding a bike? The Brooklyn Visions missions are just busy work. The only notable one was the one. 
You have to help a kid ask his boyfriend to homecoming, so you set up an elaborate sequence to get him to the end. But then his boyfriend starts talking. Oh, look at this. This is where we had our first date. Oh, this is the movie where we had our first kiss. <laughs> oh, the best kiss ever. I don't usually jump to the conclusion that gay relationships in video games are just woke propaganda there to virtue signal, but the way this whole relationship and dialogue is structured really seems like Insomniac just wanted to make an extra push for brownie points. It's so hammy that it doesn't feel genuine, if you know what I mean. But then I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm just reading into it too much. Maybe they really do care about promoting inclusivity, and they just went about it in a very corny way. Surely they have to really care- Oh, wait, they removed it from the Middle East version. Ooh. That's a little awkward now, isn't it? Spider bots and photo ops are your collectible missions. The two I would say are genuinely bad are the unidentified targets and the venom nests. The unidentified targets force you to track a drone for a certain amount of time, which just drags. They try to add some mystery with a bunch of Kraven's targets scrambled together and each drone you catch singles one out, but my god is this tedious. The Venom Nest has the greatest mission design ever introduced to man. DEFEND THE AREA MISSIONS! <laughs> That's right, you get to fight off waves and waves of symbiote soldiers, we'll get to that later, and protect the sonic disruptor before it activates and destroys the nest. In just two minutes! I'm not exaggerating when I say I did one mission of these, and then I just said, nope, I'm not doing this again, I'm done, I, I don't care if I got a nice suit at the end, it's just cosmetic. Fuck this. <laughs> also, unfortunately, Miles' side mission just didn't do it for me. It revolved around him trying to recover stolen musical instruments from the Harlem Cultural Center, and it's just kind of there. I know there's music enthusiasts that may take more of a liking to this, but I prefer the side missions that have other superheroes and villains attached to it, not just a corrupt investor. So compare these to the first game, where you had your respective gang hideouts, backpacks, landmarks, research stations, black cat stakeouts, pigeons, and taskmaster challenges. Not, not counting the DLC activities. Backpacks are better than spider bots because you get a memento from Peter's past that added some character and not just, oh, here's some tech parts. Landmark photos are better than just photos of two random people playing music. Research stations were a little more engaging than the EMF missions because they had less gimmicks about them. The Black Cat Stakeouts were just great, simple and effective, and perfectly encapsulate the teasing nature that Black Cat shows towards Spider-Man. Pigeons were quick and effective collectibles with Howard attached to it, so that was an added bonus. And I've said my piece on the Taskmaster stuff. None of the side content in the first game felt like filler. It was actually something that you wanted to do and, dare I say, looked forward to doing. I can't say that for the side activities in Spider-Man 2. Maybe it's just me, maybe it's not, but either way, in my eyes, it's a definite downgrade from the first game. So now we get to the place where Insomniac placed most of their resources. The story. Because this is a PlayStation Studios game and we want to make cinematic narrative experiences. And if my review so far has been anything to go by, you can deduce where I'm gonna go with this. Now look, when you're tasked with following up such a cohesive and focused story, and possibly the greatest incarnation of Spider-Man and Peter Parker I've ever seen, it's always going to be hard to replicate that same success. And unfortunately with Spider-Man 2, I don't think that they were able to do it on the same level this time around. Now, you're never going to get me to not care about Spider-Man, but my biggest problem with the story of Spider-Man 2 is that throughout the entire runtime, it felt very predictable. In the first game, you never really had a grasp on where the story was going to go because Martin Lee is not as well known throughout the Spider-Man lore, and everything that came with him was a genuine shock. Plus, Miles' story was not as well established in the MCU, so it allowed for him to burst onto the scene in a big way. And even though you knew where Dr. Octavius' plot was going, it was never the main focus until right up to the end where it became a problem. The story of Venom has been told so many times, and he was the first villain featured in the trailer, so you know he's gonna be the main focus. You also kinda know who it's gonna be from the start. Yeah. It's Harry. As soon as the developers came out and said, it's not Eddie Brock, I immediately said, okay, it's Harry. Because every time Harry Osborn shows up in Spider-Man lore, something always goes down with him. Not to mention that he has a symbiote on him in the tank in the post credit scene of the first game. So come on, I mean, put the two to two together. It's not hard to figure out. 
Now, do not get me wrong. The cinematic nature, great action set pieces, and the writing still make it compelling enough where you're not completely bored. And the performances across the board, once again, are perfection. Yuri Lowenthal is the perfect voice for Spider-Man. He encapsulates everything about this character. It's not what it looks like. Okay, before we get down to business, there's something I have to tell you. I'm fresh out of honey. And when he gets the symbiote suit and his voice starts getting darker, he sells it hard. Ah, you're too weak to get control back, aren't you? I'm gonna have to punch you out myself! No wonder your family left you! You're not strong enough! If this man's not nominated for best performance at the end of the year, there needs to be an investigation conducted, preferably by the FBI. Also, can I just say this? Ever since Marvel has started showcasing Miles Morales in both the games and the Spider-Verse movies, they have handled his character flawlessly. They haven't made him a walking political statement, the people around him are not dumbed down to make him look better, he's actually given a very compelling story and character that makes you want to root for him. So much so that after a while, you don't just view him as Black Spider-Man, you view him as young Spider-Man. When you get to that point where everything about you is so well written that you can find so many things to get attached to without even considering things like skin color, that's how you know you have a great character on your hands. Too often in Hollywood, they'll try to promote a certain group, but just use it to cram down certain political views and don't bother giving their protagonists anything compelling besides their race or gender. So they just end up becoming a walking label and many times completely unlikable, which actually, believe it or not, is more likely to brew resentment towards said group. That's crazy. I know it's very hard to believe. This is why Ahsoka is so beloved by the Star Wars community and why Rey is universally despised. But when my Miles is the focus of the story, believe it or not, he's the best part about Spider-Man 2, primarily his arc with Martin Lee. As Kraven has been releasing supervillains from prison to fight them, Lee is among the ones released, and Miles begins to struggle with the urge to take revenge for the death of his dad. And it showcases the moral dilemma that a superhero may have even though they take an oath of justice, especially one as young as Miles. And he even gets a great Walter White moment where he watches as Lee begins to drown in his cell before coming to his senses. From there, we get Lee exploring Miles' mind and discovering his identity, all while awakening his persona. And we see the doubts he's harboring as he thinks he's letting everybody down. This entire arc is the highlight of the story. Everything else? Eh, not so much. The return of Harry sees the original gang reunite and Peter is absolutely beside himself. And the dynamic between the two of them and MJ is definitely heartwarming, but this leads us to a various amount of on-rail segments that we all hate, like riding a bike, slowly walking through a carnival, slowly walking through their new environmental foundation that's definitely not exploring better ways to grow weed, along with its various on-rail zip-to-wall crawling sections and those MJ stealth missions. These are the moments in Spider-Man games and PlayStation Studios games in general where it just takes you out of the story. Nobody likes these. You're trying to make it more cinematic, but it's just making the experience worse. Stop doing it. Sincerely, Eventually, you find out that Harry is harboring the symbiote and briefly becomes Peter's sidekick and slowly phasing out Miles, which doesn't last long because Craven has had enough of Spider Man's shit and actually kills him. Yes. Peter dies, and to save him, the symbiote has to transfer itself from Harry to Peter, which gives him the symbiote suit, and things progress how you think they will. I will say, this is handled miles better than Spider-Man 3 did it. You could consider this the Venom redemption arc, if you will. Eventually, Peter gets mean enough where Miles has to step in and beat some sense into him, which gets the symbiote off of him and finds its way back to Harry, where he turns into Venom. Which I have to say, I thought the Venom sequence was kind of a letdown. This should not have been a regular action sequence jacked up a bit. This should have been full symbiote surge times two. Everything should be a one shot. Really hammer home the strength of Venom. He shouldn't be having problem with shields. I know you can grab them, but it's not as impactful. Then you can change back to the regular action sequence when you fight Kraven. I'm not gonna lie, throughout this entire Venom storyline, I was begging for a curveball, and for the most part, we never get one. The only time I sat up and actually felt shock was when Venom 
turned MJ into Scream. Yes, yes, this is what I wanted. Yes, Peter now all of a sudden is forced to fight his girlfriend in a fight straight out of Dark Souls. What the hell? Yeah, someone's getting charged with domestic violence, and I, uh, uh, I don't think it's me. MJ's inner thoughts about how inferior she's felt to Peter and how he's been controlling her life finally come out in this great fight, and then... It's over. Damn it! Imagine if you had to deal with both Venom and Scream for the rest of the game. So Peter is forced to fight not only his best friend, but now his girlfriend. Both his childhood companions, who he's made so many memories with. You know how much life would have been injected into the story if that was the case? Instead, the story falls back into the predictable formula. All this, by the way, is relegating Miles to the sideline for most of the runtime, which is a shame when his story is the most engaging in the entire game, including his mission with Black Cat, where you're jumping through interdimensional portals to help her escape Kraven's hunters, which is also where we find out that she's bisexual now. Um, okay. I guess we can now call her... Bye, Felicia. Instead of more missions like this, we get more stuff with MJ, where her last sequence just turns into a third-person shooter. Hey guys, welcome to my review for The Last of Us. This time, Ellie has a laser gun, she's a redhead, and uh, she is now straight. Also, I know the reason why the symbiote army's in the game, because this is Venom Harry's idea of healing the world, but this really just feels like they're here because they needed goons for Spider-Man to fight. It just feels weird because Venom has never had an army in any media portrayal I've ever seen him in. In the comics, he has a Venom army, but it's more specific Venom villains like Carnage, Scream, Riot, those type of guys, not just nameless thugs. Maybe I sound nuts here, but that's how it comes across at first glance. All of this, unfortunately, makes Kraven feel like nothing more than a setup villain. Now, when he's on screen and his story's being explored, shit goes down. You know, like killing Peter. But that's the problem. When he's on screen, he does not get a lot of exposure, which is a shame because he is written very well. The whole purpose of him coming to New York for this hunt is because he has actually been diagnosed with cancer, and rather than wait for cancer to take him out, he just says, that, I want to die in combat, but he's so strong that no supervillain is able to kill him, so he has to keep searching for contenders. That's f***ing badass. They even show him killing Scorpion. That is how you set up a strong villain. I mean, the whole time Peter and Venom are fighting him, he's just begging for them to go nuts because he wants to die. And when Venom finally defeats him, he just thanks him before Venom bites his head off. All of this is great. Why is there not more of it? Because of this, he's forced to be characterized by his henchmen, who do show up and cause problems throughout the story, but unfortunately, they feel kind of incompetent, especially in the MJ stealth sections. They even get called out by Kraven in one of the missions where he just says plainly, you're getting outsmarted by a normal girl. Wake the hell up and get to it. This also might be a hot take, but I think just showing the Sinister Six's equipment and then coming to the conclusion that Kraven killed them doesn't hit as hard as it should. Bear with me, I know there's a lot of collectibles in the game, but how cool would it be if you can collect video files showing Kraven fighting and and actually killing them. He is fighting in some facility. There's gotta be cameras in the room. Show him actually killing them. That would hit way harder and really establish this guy as an unstoppable force. All of these things just add up to a story that felt largely predictable and was filled with a lot of missed opportunities, which if this is what your main focus is for your video game, it starts to become a bigger problem overall. Again, the story is not bad, and it's told very well for how predictable it is, but if you got people calling you the greatest superhero game of all time, I can't be feeling this way by the time the story is done, especially when I didn't feel that way once with the first game. At the end of it all, despite my criticisms of the game, Spider-Man 2 still finds a way to be a worthy sequel to the first game. I know this review sounded more negative than my actual feelings, but Insomniac has proved once again that they are worthy to be the Shepherds of Spider-Man, even if they do have some things they need to clean up with their open world and their story beats. They continue to craft a Spider-Man franchise that has the best balance of gameplay and story out of any of PlayStation Studios franchises. Yes. I said it, even better than God of War. 
The version of Spider-Man that they have crafted rivals any of the movies, and they continue to raise the profile of Miles Morales to a point where, when it comes time for him to fully take over as Spider-Man, he'll have earned it. There's still a bunch of villains to explore in the later games, so it'll be intriguing to see who they feature in any DLC or future installments, even though we have a good feeling of who's coming next. However, when I talk Game of the Year contenders, it will no doubt be on people's list and some people's choice, but for me personally, this year has been so stacked and there have been so many games that I just had way more fun playing that unfortunately, this go around, Spider-Man 2 is the odd one out, but there still should be respect put on this game. No doubt about that. Another great release for PlayStation and another successful Spider-Man game, and it gets an 8 out of 10. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you've watched all the way through, what do you guys think of Spider-Man 2? Do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? Either way, let me know in the comments because this is your daily reminder that I am a madman and I read all of them. Other than that, please hit that like button and smash that subscribe button because this is the only place to get reviews this damn good. All right, everybody, once again, thank you so much and I'll see you all next time.